This week, I'm taking a look at Light from Uncommon Stars by Reika Aoki. It's, I apologize if I mispronounced the name. It's been a while since I last heard it pronounced, and I could not find a recording of that before I started doing this video. Which is the, you know, this is the second of the Hugo Award nominees for 2022 that I have uh, perused this year. Or not perused, I, I read. So there is some discussion as to whether there needs to be a clear dividing line um, between the genres of science fiction as fantasy, a debate in which gallons of ink and perhaps even uh, thousands of gallons of ink have been spilled on in the past and innumerable pixels in on likewise for online discussion. And honestly, it's something that's going to happen in the far future. Ron, as someone who has encountered Shadowrun during my formative years of middle school, shortly after Dungeons and Dragons, I have ultimately become someone who has come to realize that fantasy and science fiction are like chocolate and peanut butter. They go very well together. While I will admit for past reviews I have done for a Hugo nominees, I have leaned in terms of for what my book of choice would be for works that are, that are just like that, that. I leaned away from works that are exclusively fantasy from my picks for the award, but I do not object to works that have both. Um, and I certainly greatly enjoy works that have both. So when Light from Uncommon Stars came up as the book pick for the Sword and Laser Books Club, and as I've attempted to get caught up in my book reading, I put it on my list, even more so bumping it to the top once I saw it was nominated for uh, the Hugo Award. So now that I have read it, it is time to give my thoughts. The novel has two main tacks, one fantastical on leaning to the side of a degree of magical realism and the other more science fictional, but still somewhat like magical realist or science fictional realist in a weird sense. On the fantastical side, there's a plot around uh, Trina Nien, a transgender woman and aspiring violinist who flees her abusive bigoted parents along with her violin and ends up running into virtuoso violin teacher Shizuka Satomi in Los Angeles. Six of Shizuka's last six students, meaning all of them, have achieved superstardom all before their careers collapsed and they all suffered a tragic end because Shizuka is the queen of hell who sold her soul to the devil in order to be able to continue to play and is ultimately attempting to get out of the deal by providing seven souls to hell. She's provided six and is now looking for the seventh and the deadline for the um, for this little loan, so to speak, is coming up. Now Katrina's talent impresses Shizuka, and she decides to teach the runaway. But she also starts to develop second thoughts as to whether she's willing to send this young woman to eternal damnation. The science fictional side comes with a Los Angeles donut place called a Star Gate Donut double R's, um, and I can't roll my R's, so I can't pronounce it appropriately, which had formerly been run by a Vietnamese family who named the uh, place Donut Shop after the arcade game, and who decided to sell the restaurant to some new owners who present as being from Cambodia, but are in fact aliens from outer space. Specifically, they are on the run from a massive cosmic calamity called just the end plague. And in the process of running this donut shop, the ship's captain Lan ends up running into Shizuka and the two hit it off. And so the core plot of the book becomes to an extent, can Katrina with her eschewing of musical convention being self-taught with a focus on playing anime and video game music and Lan with her delicious, delicious donuts, save a soul. To give a sense of what the tone of the novel is, the first piece of music that we hear or see since we're reading Katrina play at Shizuka's outside of warmups is a piece of music from not Undertale. I mean, to be clear, the plot of the game in question is described as skewing somewhat differently from Undertale's plot, but the tones of the story and themes of the narrative and how it interacts with the game's mechanics does feel like it is meant to evoke Undertale enough to enough of an extent that I've got this vibe 
reading it that should this novel ever be adapted to any sort of more visual medium, visual and auditory medium, whether at the screen or the stage, because it honestly you could you could do this on the stage to an extent. Um, the only right move for the adaptation would be to commission Toby Fox to write those pieces of music for the work, unless Toby Fox has, God forbid, somehow milkshake ducked by that point, but hopefully that never happens. It makes for a work that could be tremendously dark, dour, and somber, but it pulls itself out of being maudlin by the same way that Lan and Katrina seek to save Shizuka, perhaps indirectly, through the strength of personal emotional connections and what they can inspire us to do. Additionally, the narrative of the story is a really interesting job of getting into sort of the classical music soloist scene outside of um, performing in organizations and orchestra or that sort of thing uh, from everything from stuff related to maintenance and the care and maintenance and upkeep of your violin to rehearsals and contests and recitals for gaining visibility in the scene and all this, that, and the other thing. It is a world that I've never really delved into on my own as much as I enjoy listening to classical music on my own time and getting this perspective on this from this angle is an interesting take. Um, the other part of the plot with uh, Katrina and her experiences as a trans woman, obviously I can't speak to any firsthand knowledge of that, um, to how true that is, but it feels true. It feels emotionally resonant and it is upfront and honest without feeling necessarily crass or, and certainly not exploitative. Uh, it, is truthful and it has that, that ring of that which is important now again i can't speak too well for that side of things as far as wherever the uh if the author gets anything wrong but from all i've seen about the author's bona fides they seem to be coming from a point of if not first-hand knowledge then at least having people who they could speak to to get to get their firsthand knowledge and make sure that they are not off base in those regards. If I have a gripe, it has to do with how the whole concept of the end plague is set up and how it ultimately plays into the conclusion of the novel. Without getting too much into spoilers, one of the developments that um, Land discovers while living on Earth and getting to know Shizuka is realizing the potential possibilities for music as, if not a cure for the end plague, than a recovery from it. Now, the flippant scene thing to say would be to say, oh, I'd previously seen a concept like this in Macross 7, but Macross 7 is still, as of this writing, not legally licensed for distribution outside of Japan. And while it is not unreasonable to say, they'll, to say that the author could have had an opportunity to watch a fan sub of it, as so many other people have done, um, it would also be... So it would be somewhat unreasonable to go there and say, oh, yes, you watched this pirated thing. That would be that would be awkward and potentially get in hot water. So I will not say that um, the author has any, necessarily had any exposure to um, that particular series. However, the way it is executed here is definitely very different from stories about music and particularly rock music as having a power to destroy totalitarianism, like in Styx's Kilroy was here, or AKB 0078, or even to a lesser extent, the original Macross, or for mass spiritual freedom, as with the Who's Lighthouse Project. But though I would describe the execution here as probably being closer to the latter, but as a more personal sense. Oddly enough, the closest we have to a show airing this season, or have to how it's done here, is a show airing this season, I should say, which also literally makes it impossible for Yoki to have read it beforehand, and vice versa, considering the production process for animation and how long it takes to make a show, it is absolutely impossible for the creators of the show in question, that is, 
Healer Girl, having had an opportunity to read this book before, or had any exposure to this book before that hit, hit the air. Although even in that case, that is a instance of literal physical healing, magical physical healing, as opposed to a spiritual, emotional, and psychic healing from music. So this definitely is a very different vibe, and I, I do appreciate that. I just wish its integration with the concept of the end plague felt that didn't feel quite as clunky to me. It, it it's not bad. It just has that moment of where where I can just kind of hear the gears, the narrative gears grind. It's not enough to destroy the book's transmission, but it is a slightly unpleasant experience the moment it happens, and then we move on from it. In all, Light from Uncommon Stars was a, a tremendously strong book, and it's a nice, lighter story that I really enjoyed and kind of scratched an itch that I needed recently. Um, I don't know, at the at the moment, like with admittedly just the two books read, um, where I would put this in terms of this or a master of Dijin, a Jin. I liked Master of Jin a lot. Uh, these are both very brisk reads. Like, these are both reads that really moved quickly, but and had really great characters that I enjoyed sinking, enjoyed spending time with. Um, but uh, Master of Jin, hmm. I mean, both of those are kind of tied in my mind in terms of what which one I'd go for as a pick at this point if I had to choose right now by the books I've read so far. Also, this book really left me absolutely craving donuts because with the whole donut shop plot, like, oh, I, I should get some good donuts. There are good donut places near me. I should get some donuts. And it has been a tremendous amount of willpower that's kept me from making detours while running errands to go to some of our local donut, like donut places and coming back with a half dozen, uh, fritters and such, um, on my way home. So in any case, uh, there will be links in the show notes below as to where you can get this, um, as far as affiliate links for where you can get the book from Amazon or from independent booksellers via Alibris. Um, buying anything through, any, through those links helps to support the blog. As far as the donut side is concerned, you're on your own. Um, there actually used to be a app, iOS only, that would get provide information on where to like best places to get donuts near you. And I thought I looked that up. And, oh, that's really neat. I was going to put a recommendation for it, but then I discovered it doesn't work anymore. So, oh well. Uh, so. In that case, I have to leave this up to you then. Um, in the comments, I'd like to know from your metropolitan area or general locality, what is your go-to for, for donuts? Where is the best donuts near you? Um, this is a service that, that needs to be provided to the world. For me, my places of choice are uh, Heavenly Donuts. If I, this is in the Portland metro area. Our Heavenly Donuts and uh, Donut Land are two of my go-tos. Um, I've also heard good things about Blue Star Donuts, but I have never quite been in a location to uh, get some from them. So your picks, feel free to post them in the comments. I'm interested in what, to hear what you have to say. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. And also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.